Go live. There we go. Okay. I just had to hit live. Look at that. I had to hit like Crazy. 10 times. <laughs> Perfect. There we go. Yay. There I am on my Facebook screen right behind. Good. I'm even. So cute. Okay. Hopefully it doesn't make too much noise. Okay. We'll do a little bit of that. All right. Well, You're welcome to, to Hannah's. See. Yay! <laughs> so, um, I think we were in touch about one or two years ago. I think now I reached out to you for your email on your website. Just that I've had, you know, after hearing Changes, which is a beautiful album. And I just reached out and I want, I wondered who you were, you know, were working with. And I think you connected me with Lawrence, Lawrence Hopgood at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And had a nice conversation with him. Just really was you know, understanding your guys' work together. And, you know, I love some of his arrangements. Um, like, you know, Let's Stay Together, which is one that I'm thinking of putting on my upcoming album. So. Yay! <laughs> Such a classic, those 70s songs. They're kind of like the hidden ones, not the ones people think of, I yeah. guess, jazz artists to cover particularly. But um, but you you get that because I feel like you're somewhat, you're a crossover artist, right? You're jazz and pop. Yeah. It is, a, it is a tough road to not only find and figure out, but then to even have to like put any sort of label on it is a little strange because you just want to be an artist. Um, but yeah, what, is, what I figured out, you know, in retrospect is that it was very much a crossover album and it was like in the early stages of my songwriting and it kind of just like led me to a much deeper songwriting revelation. <laughs> Ooh, cool. And that was in 2018. So, so the past, you know, couple of years, you, the, you know, you've been getting deeper into songwriting. Yeah. I, uh, basically just started exploring, um, a lot of my personal interests when it comes to songwriting and structure. Um, and it, it's a very new discipline for me. I know the discipline of like practicing voice or practicing a tune, but having to practice writing when there is no inspiration from the ether or whoever, and you're just kind of forced to like hunger down and, and do your thing. Well, through quarantine, I realized, wow, like this is, this is a really challenging thing for me to just kind of like sit down, close the part of the brain that wants to edit as I go and just say, I'm going to put some stuff on the page and we're going to roll with it. And we're going to have a song at some point, but don't worry about it because that's not the point. Um, so I think, yeah, I've, I've really figured out how to make songwriting um, a, a regular part of my music routine so that I feel like instead of having to say I'm this jazz pop artist, if I'm presenting my own material, I think the influence is just kind of going to speak for itself. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, having it be a part of your routine is very challenging at this point because I'm kind of finding for me as a fellow songwriter, it's so sporadic when the inspiration hits you or not at all, you know, during this time. And I, uh, so mm -hmm. I, <laughs> and that, that it's challenging to have the discipline to at least just sit down and see what comes out, you know. Right. So, so what, I think also one of the things is that. Yeah. What's been new lately? Ooh. Um, <clears throat> you so going on the songwriting thing. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> um, so doing a lot of songwriting and doing a lot of figuring out uh, kind of the overall feeling of my music as a listener, which is hard to do, especially because I haven't been performing as like a singer songwriter for very long. Um, so right now I'm kind of working towards uh, a singer-songwriter sort of album. I'm not sure if it's going to be released as an entire album or like a selection of tunes, an EP, maybe one tune here or there. Um, but just starting to figure out if I'm going to be someone who's arranging this myself or if I want to be working with people. It's kind of in the early stages, but it took me a while. There was a, a period after I released Changes where I had to really figure out what the next path would be um, where I wanted to go next, the debut album is sort of like a, a great way to put your, you know, foot out the door and say, okay, here I am. But then trying to figure out how your kind of evolution as an artist will unfold is really challenging. And it takes a lot of time, especially when you're in your like, you know, mid twenties and really just kind of fresh out the gate. 
Definitely, definitely kind of figuring out your sound when you're in what camp you're going to be a part of, you know, jazz and pop. And I love that about us that like we we're like, no, we're in the middle. We're progressive jazz artists, right? We're we're pushing the envelope, yeah. we're breaking down barriers and boundaries and, you know, changing the idea of what is traditionally a jazz artist. Just in essence, right. by girls helps changing that definition, but also by, you know, pop music. Like they're, they're starting like a pop major where I went to school, I believe at, at Michigan, I had to choose between, you know, jazz and classical. And now they have a pop major that they're thinking of starting. I'm like, wow, they're going to teach people how to become Lady Gaga. That, I know. The, the, the pop program, it's a little, I think it needs to be worked out a little bit more. Um, but same with the University of Miami. I mean, they had a, the Bruce Hornsby, like, Creative American music program, which is all about songwriting. They had jazz. They had classical. They had musical theater. And when I was thinking about, like, applying to school, it was pop. There was, like, a pop program at USC. Um, it was jazz, classical. Um, and I didn't want to do the musical theater route because I felt that I didn't have the chops for, like, acting and dancing and everything like that. Um, but I think they developed this, in addition to the songwriting program, this pop music program, but it's really vague what they're trying to do with you. Um, I think there just needs to be a little bit more wiggle room with people who just want to be able to cover other songs. Like, where is that? And I don't really know where it fits in right now in general, just like this torch singer, not really a jazz singer, but like, you know, that kind of like Linda Ronstadt or, or people who just sing, you know, other people's songs. <laughs> They're just like you know, Al Green or, or Marvin Gaye. Like, are, are they jazz? Stevie Wonder. I mean, what if you want to cover all them? Who do you become? Are you then, you know, soul? Right. Are you jazz? It's like, what are you? And the other thing too, which is unique, and you've, I think, been a part of this infrastructure is in, in with the Sarah Vaughan jazz, you know, competition, vocal jazz competition and the, and the, you know, Montreal and Montreal, you know, all the jazz festivals that you've been a part of, which is awesome. I feel like there's in jazz, there's like that structure that's there. It's like, okay, if this happens, then this happens. Then your album comes out and you know what I mean? Like they provide an educational right. foundation to launch people. Whereas like, if you're a songwriter and you're like, Hey, you know, what I do or a pop artist, there isn't like, oh, I can apply to this competition or I can try to get into downbeat because it's, you're off maybe in your own world. I don't know. What are your thoughts? I think there's a lot of liberty now in, again, like this after winning the competition and, and doing an album with a major label, I think there's a lot of freedom in being your own artist, whether you consider yourself jazz or whatever, you're still an independent artist if you're releasing under your own name and, and there's just so much more you can do. I think there are songwriting competitions, things like that. Um, I mean, we all know like NBC The Voice, American Idol, those places are like a what, you know, we as Americans think is like a really good launching pad. Um, yeah. and jazz is really tiny. You know, if jazz is, is so small, if you want to reach a bigger audience, you have to be a crossover artist. You have to have something else. And Nora Jones is like one of the pinnacle kind of like jazz crossovers. I think even Joni Mitchell before that had a large part of just kind of, and you, you named a few, I think, huge influences in Stevie's music, <clears throat> where you can tell that like, you know, there is a, a lot of listening to Black American music you know, jazz and where it all began. Um, and I think also that following your instincts and, and following whatever kind of like your passions take you is super important. And if you don't, you're going to end up boxing yourself into, I am jazz. I must be jazz. This won't work. If, and you don't want to have to say like, this isn't going to work. You want to be able to say like, I'm going to make this work. Yeah. So, mm. yeah. That's interesting. So how did the, um, so the Sarah Vaughn, you won that vocal competition in 2015. And then in 2018, your album came out changes. So in that interim is a, I'm just curious as a part of being, being associated with and signed to quote unquote, a, a major label are, you know, do they provide you like with composers and arrangers and songwriters or were you like, Hey, I already have people I want to work with. Or were they more like, Hey, here's your team, Ariana, here's your team. So I went in there basically saying, okay, I'm yours. Tell me what I need to do. You know, I was so young. I was 22. I just out of school. 
so for me, it was more like, this is entirely a learning experience. Um, and I mean, it took three years and I'm, I really mean three years to figure this out. Um, because I was so young, I hadn't had any time to be like, okay, and what is the album I want to put out in this world? And coming up with the idea of Lawrence Hobgood was, yeah, like a lot of conversation with um, the people at Concord and back and forth, you establish, you know, a few core connections there. And eventually, yeah, they, they'll reach out if they think it's the right thing. And then Lawrence and I basically met up here in New York um, at Yamaha Studios. Um, we played a couple tunes. And once we felt like, yeah, let's do this, then it became on us more to keep working together, putting in the time, and then we'd bounce back to the label um, every once in a while just to make sure that we were on track. And I think that's the difference here is that you have this umbrella of label, and there are certain things that don't fit outside the label. You know, you can't do certain things, um, which is great in terms of figuring out a really cohesive record for that niche, but you're limiting yourself. Um, and I don't mean that in like a bad or a good way. You're, you know, kind of, you know, taking the fine tooth comb and you're going, all right, don't need this. Don't need that. Here's what I'm going to include. But I think also there's so much else to an artist that unless, and, you know, being under Concord is, is pretty jazz. Like it's, I can't really do whatever I want. It's, it's a jazz label and you know I think pulling the artist that you like on the label really helps like oh I really like this oh I like where she's going I like where that's going um because you want to be able to appeal to the jazz novices and um you know the purists and uh, maybe the pop people and it's hard you know like, who's gonna dig it <laughs> Yeah, but I think your album really does strike that chord in the middle because if I'm listening to it, you're, you're doing standards, you're doing, you know, you have original music, you have a variety, you have stuff from the 70s. And I think the fact that you worked with an arranger and put the unique, your unique twist on it and, you know, and you're an arranger too, right? So I imagine you both like yeah. worked with arrangements together. It was probably a very organic process. It was, and it was, it was quite enjoyable. I mean, the process was, everything. I mean, it wasn't like, okay, Lawrence, love this tune, sending it your way. Let's talk in a week. It was more like, okay, like, love this tune. I'm sitting in your living room with you. Let's figure out a couple ideas for whether it's a, you know, motivic thing that we're figuring out, or even just a baseline or a few chords that just feel right together, even as a group starting somewhere and then building from that. And Lawrence and I are both pretty intellectually complex individuals. So there was a lot that we came up with just, you know, all the time. And some of them were, you know, total trash, you know, like, what were we thinking? But fun to figure out and kind of join heads. I think, I mean, collaborating is the best way to learn more about yourself and more about different ways of approaching music. I mean, you know, he's 35 years my senior. It's like, you know, I was just he was like, but you really want to approach it from the dominant chord. And I was like, yes, of course. What was I thinking before? You know, it's like all these other things that he would say where I'm like, well, it sounds good to me. So that was also really nice. And um, I, I think it helped also with the age gap that I was able to see him as this mentor figure and kind of, you know, warming me up to the idea of like what studio time is going to look like. It's not college studio time. It is like, you know, we're paying by the minute. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So once that came out, you know, as far as like, I, one thing that really struck me is you have really beautiful, well-rounded branding, really lovely website, you know, amazing cover art and, and, you know, in infographics about your shows and things. Is that, I'm just curious, is that something that the label um, provides as far as part of like a, the marketing package to you or there was, yeah. So there was um, a decent marketing package where they, uh, I mean, I will tell you, picking the cover for, you know, changes was, I mean, a really long process. I mean, doing a photo shoot when I was like, okay, what do I do here? Who, do I decide the pose or do you decide the pose? Like, there was just so much, you know, I was so naive. And so it was really nice to have their help. Um, but because there's a deadline and because I wasn't certain what I wanted at times, it became like, mom, what do you think? Dad, what do you think? Okay, everyone, okay, we're doing this. Um, but it was nice to have a little bit of a push and it was nice to have their help. I had, I mean, leaving 
college, I, as a, you know, jazz vocal performance major, I really didn't understand what I was getting myself into. Had I studied a lot more of like the business and marketing side of things. Yeah. I think we all probably have the same opinion. It's like, whoa, we're, what do you mean? We're just thrown out into the real world. There's no, what are we doing? No, I don't remember a marketing course for, do you remember a marketing course? (laughs) There, I took two music business classes. Okay, yeah. Me, I took two, and now they probably have like a whole core curriculum where it's like a huge, it's like the whole year or something. <laughs> right. And the, my favorite part is that the business classes that we're all forced to take are for everyone. It's for classical musicians, jazz, pop. Everyone is in there. And so we're all going to do the same thing to market ourselves. Are you sure about that? I'm pretty sure there's a different agenda, like making a record and, you know, like, <laughs> so position like two different things you know <laughs> uh-huh uh-huh totally so cool. learning learning on your own <laughs> so who encouraged you to apply to, to the Sarah Vaughn vocal competition was that something that you just always wanted to do was she like a big inspiration of yours or how did that happen um it, interestingly enough just because you brought it up uh yeah she was a huge inspiration to me I kind of came out of college <laughs> with three you know, top jazz singers, like, my my top three were Sarah, Carmen McRae, Nancy Wilson, and I was like, okay, those are my chicks, I love them, this competition happened to be the exact same time as the Monk competition, um, literally the same weekend, um, and, you know, for vocalists, the Monk competition comes around, you know, every several years, and Sarah Baum was only in its fourth year, so I was a recent grad from UM, and my former um, director of the jazz vocal department there, Larry Lappin had this group for, you know, just like jazz singers who want to get together on the weekends and sing music. And he mentioned it to me and I just applied thinking like, well, <laughs> I already have these recordings, you know, I sent them for a month, I might as well. And I, I was appalled. I could not believe it. I was like, what? This is not, no, that was, I don't know. The universe has something else in store, but I am, yeah, I'm super grateful that I, I clicked the button and just kind of, I think that's also like a big teaching moment when you have a little bit of an expectation and sight set on the monk institution being like the competition you're like ready to be in and you apply something else on the side, like, eh, whatever. And the fact that there was no weight on that, there was no, you know, pressure for that to have like an outcome that served me or my expectation was like maybe that was the blessing where it was like whoa things happen when you maybe don't care that much (laughs) universe right there yeah (laughs) definitely Mm -hmm. oh well that's fantastic so are are you still with them are you going to do another album with them are you going to switch late maybe go blue note i don't (laughs) i don't know i know right Hi guys, I'm just switching over to your friend Blue Note over here. No, I think um, I think the next project that I'll be releasing is probably not going to be under that umbrella. I'm not sure yet if I want to record on my own and then shop it to labels, um, or if I really want to start making money off of the streams and like kind of. I think that might be an interesting route to take. Um, you- I haven't thought about that for me. How do you make money off of streams? Or there's like it's like zero point one zero cent. <laughs> oh, it's it's literally it's nothing. Yeah. But if I at least own the rights, I guess, to my music, and let's say, you know, ten years from now everything's going super, and I'm just like woo, then that'll come back to help me. I also feel like I have more musical freedom. Um. I mean, I've been talking to, you know, a couple other people who either arrange or have, you know, some sort of knowledge of the business so that I have some guidance. I think uh, trying to do your own thing without without guidance can be hard, but you want to make sure you don't have too much guidance. Otherwise, you're going to miss those things that, like, you really want to do. And you have enough guidance. I mean, we've been in school forever. So I think the next record is probably going to be more of a, a self, at least, um, figured out on my own with like a couple people who I know have my back and maybe, you know, pulling people. I know there, I, I established some relationships at Concord or with other people that are really strong that I feel I could use even outside of the labels kind of 
niche. Yeah. I'm excited. Are you thinking it's going to be kind of a, a crossover where, you know, more of your originals? I think definitely more original stuff. Um, I've got a good collection of tunes that I'm kind of ready to, you know, share. And I'm, I'm having a hard time fitting myself again into a category like, oh, she's so bad or she's so bad. Um, good thing. But I think figuring yeah figuring out what an album of all ariana material would look like and you know i mean i definitely am my own type of <laughs> songwriter um but i think that's the most honest and the most truthful especially when i have so many influences i'm constantly like should i do musical theater no should i just go back to Glasgow? no should i just stay with jazz or should i just be a disney princess and cover all their songs and having those options can be really daunting because you feel like okay i can do anything but like not one thing the best and you know I don't know which way to go um so I'm like wow if I just write all this stuff it's there the I, I don't have to think about the rest and then is it like you gotta ask yourself too like yeah. and I find my same vote as you right now like okay is my goal to write listenable music that I, I just want people to sell like write pop tunes just so I can sell or is it really no I want to write music that like honors who I am that that's authentically me you know, and it's just, it's that, that pull between being, like, commercially viable and being, like, authentic. It's, like, you try to get in somewhere in the middle. Right. It's hard. It's really hard. I think, yeah, I, I think the label can have a, a huge say of how authentic they will let you continue to be. And I think Sarah Brayless is a perfect example. I mean, that first record, Little Voice, um, that, like, really made a dent in the pop world. I mean, Love Song, I don't know if you know what that's about, but it's basically about yeah, like trying to write a song to please a label. And I think the way she approached it was was kind of like, hey, all right, um, I'm going to give you that love song and, like, I'm going to show that I'm a part of it. But, like, just so you know, like, I'm no cookie-cutter pop star. And she's not. And that's why she's such a big inspiration to a lot of people. And there's so many unknown hidden pop stars because they're not traditional pop and they're not top 40. And it's weird because we have such a huge, you know, platform of all this music created in people's bedrooms and attics and it's like wow lots of subgenre here <laughs> very much so no it's just funny because i had a friend say like why why do jazz it's so hard why, why not just you know write a pop song or and become whatever famous or do your thing and then go and do the thing you love and, it, and just a couple of people have said that to me and some other artists and i i don't know i got to thinking like it's actually harder than you'd think to just write a really simple pop song when we come from that jazz tradition where we're typically more accustomed to more complex harmonies, richer, you know, nuances to just turn around and write like, you know, like, like literally like. Yeah. Something literally like that, just very stripped down. <laughs> it's, it's really challenging. Even I have trouble and I'm not a pianist and by any means I mean I like sing and play in my bedroom and I've gotten out and started doing that a little more regularly um but yeah the the harmony has to be more complex like our ears crave yeah. other tones we crave other intervals we crave clustery sounds um but I also think that there has to be some sort of musical revolution again. Like pop music can't continue to be and not that it's all bad but pop music can't continue to be I mean, it's better than it was, I think, maybe in 2000, oof, like, 10, it was really crappy, 2000, like, I don't know, I remember all those really bad songs, but I think it has to, there has to be a revolution, where it's like, you know, kind of like the Beatles, and Joni, and Bob Dylan, and all these other, like, true, heartfelt, authentic songwriters were able to kind of say, hey, like, this is what it's about, you know? And it, but I think the reason we do it, like you said, the reason that we take either the jazz route or the less like traditional pop singer songwriter route is that we believe that what we're doing is the most authentic for us. And we wouldn't feel good. I think no amount of money or like fame could make you feel good about performing something like that, you know? So I'm, I'm big into the, I mean, there's for most jazz people, it's like we do it because we love it. And that's, 
I know. That's why I told my friend. I said, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. It's, <laughs> it's hard and I wouldn't even want to. I just, I have to be myself, you know, it's just the way it yeah. is. But I, I, I really like what you're saying about a, a revolution. Have you talked to uh, like any other millennials or colleagues in, in your peer group? What, what do they think about it? I'm just curious. That's the first time I've heard someone say a new musical revolution. I, I, I know. So I heard it. <laughs> from uh, one of my other voice teachers who I, I take care of her, um, her son when we're not quarantined. I spend a couple hours with him. He's like two and a half and he's so sweet. But um, Sarah Toller and I met on a recording session way back when, when I just moved here. And I was over at her house and we were listening to some music and she knows I'm more of like a 70s Johnny Mitchell diehard, you know, just kind of other end of the spectrum pop star. Um, but we were talking about how music feels so strange now. A lot of like popular music can just, I mean, even just the subjects are weird. Like no, like no more dancing and let's get drunk and then dance and make out. Like I'm done with that. Um, yeah. she, like, <laughs> right. And she had mentioned something about like, you know, when Elvis was big and, you know, all these other people and there were a couple of their names. I'm not, I wasn't super into that music. Um, and then there was a revolution after that where like the less gimmicky things started to come out and it's like truer jazz. And also for me, I started, or not jazz, but you know, music. And then for me in terms of jazz, it's like, wow, we had this really traditional kind of like what you would go here in New Orleans, like right now. And then it started to progress and Miles was just like, all right, but like, it doesn't always have to be so traditional. And I think that progression naturally becomes like the kind of progression I'm working with. Like, ooh, I'm, you know, trying to figure it out. And like people like Esperanza Spalding and Becca Stevens and really taking leaps of faith um, in terms of saying like, yeah, I'm a, a jazz singer, but here I go, <laughs> you know, let me fly. Yeah. So. That's inspiring. All right. Well, I think it's about time you play something. How about, um, what are you going to play for us? Is this original or? What do you how do you have in store? Yes. Um yes. Original, original, original. That is the stuff I will play. Um I'm gonna play a song that I've been playing on a few shows recently. I don't know how recently, definitely not in the last uh, six weeks, but <laughs> um this is a tune I wrote um called The Choice. I had just basically come to a point in my life where I needed to make a choice um and through this song I actually figured out where my decision was headed about six months before I made the decision so it was a really interesting way of writing a song to like write it out and be like and the end of this song is this and that's what will happen in six months you know so this is a tune um called the choice
Maybe he's lonely. You said he just can't love you like I do. He can try to change, but trust me, dear, he's not the one for you. He can't love you like I do. You're so lovable, and I could love you right if you choose. Living under one roof, sleeping in our bed, I feel further from his heart than when we slept on my sofa. Wait, wait, I'm good. There we go. Okay. I'm applauding you. <laughs> Virtually. Thank you. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Via so cute. Up there. So cute. So, oh my gosh, you know what's hilarious is okay, I have a song on my upcoming album um, to be hopefully released later this year. Just like that. Very similar. It's called Will You Be My Man? And there's one of the lyrics in there where you talk about. You know, she can't make you feel something like to the effect of she can't make you feel the way I can or something like that. I have yeah. one of the same lyrics in my song. So we share, we must share an experience. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's quite the experience. I think when you, um, well, let's just be honest, if you're dealing with two men <laughs> and you have to make a choice of who might be right for you, there's a lot of, I mean, just obvious comparing and like I couldn't help but you know pick this and pick this and then to have one it was one guy who really just kept saying he just can't love you like I do and you're lovable and you deserve this and I was like do I but do I and sometimes putting it into writing and singing it every time I can um makes it just a little more yeah man lovable he will deserve love <laughs> yeah and also, thank you for being so transparent about your songs, because sometimes a lot of artists, you know, will write personal things and not be willing to sh willing to share something personal. So, thank oh, I've got, I've got a, I've got a knack for sharing, and I have a knack for writing a lot in the song. <laughs> oh yeah, it goes I can on, write, but, I'm yeah. Gonna parse down my lyrics because I write like re like you know a lot of emotion, a lot of lyrics. And, you know, my friends are like, you need to, like, just write simpler stuff. I'm like, but I can't get my point across without words. Like, I need that. It's, I've been working lately kind of adding um, a couple things into the mix. So one thing uh, when I was writing before, um, I got feedback that it, you know, might be a little too on the nose. And I was like, but on the nose is good. People know what you're talking about. Um, yeah. And then I found a way to – be both on the nose, but maybe use a little more metaphor so that just in case there's an audience member who's like, God, it would be so similar if you just didn't use, I could really connect with maybe this word had been changed so that maybe I didn't keep sharing that this was about the same thing, you know, to keep a little ambiguity, but I, I get it. Like I'm a very, I'm a very wordy and blunt writer. And I, I feel that a lot of my, you know, idols in terms of songwriters and singers are pretty ha, have a lot to say I think uh especially Joni yes she gotta write she gotta keep writing the pen keep moving and I find that that's how it is for me and I have to kind of strip down one of my newer songs that I'm writing feels really like oh my god are there any words am I saying anything you know <laughs> it's like you know really trying to keep it cool 
So yeah, I mean, it's a fun thing to play with so that you can find what works for you. Yeah, that's very true. It's, it's a hard thing to do. And it seems like, and you're, you're not only a vocalist, pianist, composer, and arranger. So that's, that's a lot to manage. <laughs> it's, well, it's weird, especially because the last two composer, arranger, when you're writing your own songs and you're arranging your own songs, I mean, for example, like, I guess that was an arrangement. Sure. Like, I play it like that a lot of the time. But if I wanted to arrange this pretty simple arrangement, um, which I've been doing with a couple other songs going, well, if I really brought it up here and I really only kept this single note on top, like playing with a couple of the little tricks for harmony, like, okay, I'm going to add one note on top and I'm going to keep that note on top no matter what. Um, finding different ways to arrange without feeling like I need to follow something and go, ha, ha, ho, you know? But when I'm playing with my band, it's a little different. Like, we got some hits, we got some this, we got some that. Um, but I only do the original stuff with the band. I can't do no heavy hitting, no. <laughs> Yeah, I my arrangements. I, I I'm really a bad band leader in the sense that I I expect people just to like hear the arrangement and know it. Like I've gotten to the point with my music. Like I learned all that you writing great chord charts, and now I've gotten to just writing lyric sheets with chords on them. And I'm like, what is going on? Like all this education. It's like, wow, <laughs> it's so disrespectful. But that's what as a songwriter that seems totally normal. I don't even have chord changes. They're just lyrics literally just lyrics and not That's even in order <laughs> like lyric here chunk there scribble here next lyric there go back a page you'll find the last lyric you know it's like okay. <laughs> chaos me okay good I'm checking because yeah. Yeah, coming from jazz school like my senior recitals and everything you know I had all my charts organized and now it's just like here's the key here here's the lyrics just just play this feel and I'll just like sing it <laughs> that's it it's funny and also if you have I mean, if you have a band that you're used to playing with, most of the times they're going to feel you out and know what you're going for. Yeah. Most of the time. And at a certain point, charts are just getting in the way of connecting. And that's how I feel. Like, I thought about, like, oh, my God, do I know the lyrics on my songs? What will I do? And it's like, the truth is, I do know almost all the lyrics to all my songs. And if I had to read something in front of me, how disconnected it would feel. Like, yeah. I in, like, full transparency that was the first time I entered like low state in a song in a while like it's really low state like I'm looking at piles of laundry and you and you know, my cat somewhere here and it's just different environment and to feel connected like that is really special so thank you <laughs> Oh no, it is. It is any any excuse to play or to get us to play. I think you know we need all we need all the, the you know whatever the serotonin release. We need all the help yes, we can. Yes, we do. Sure. We do. Totally. You know, to lift us yeah. up. And so many artists. I mean, I I loved watching your movie with your movie your your live stream. Your recording with Perry. Um, I see a lot of Candace Springs, and I I'm just it really brings me up to think oh there's other great you know women in jazz or pop that are at least like trailblazing and just not letting tech technology get in the way. There's you know they're going through yeah. with it. They're plowing ahead. They're doing their thing. They're not letting this stop them. So yeah, totally. Yeah. Have you have you checked out Candace Springs? I actually my mom bought her. We have the same iTunes account. She's probably listening to. Um, we bought her album. I buy it for mine so that she can get it on hers. So I have listened a little bit. I haven't listened enough. Um, I, was, I think I was stuck in. Hey, like I'll get one album off Spotify that I'm really into and just like go through it. And right now it's a little dragon album that I'm like still going through. <laughs> um, but I do want to check her out because she keeps popping up. Yeah, definitely. I didn't know if you maybe knew her or at all. <laughs> I don't know her personally, no, but um, I've heard a couple of her things, which I actually really dig. And Nora Jones has been releasing some yeah. pretty interesting new stuff. Yeah, music video. I saw too. I've been merely made a statement. It was pretty powerful, her, her video. Yeah, she and she has a lot more liberty as a jazz pop artist just because of how long she's been able to keep this up. But watching her evolution as an artist has been really interesting. Just seeing what she does and how she, what she wants to do. I mean, I always think of Come Away With Me as like her album and that sound. And then the last 
record she released, the one with, uh, I don't know if it was called Just a Little Bit, but it had that song on it. And it was just, uh, it felt groovy, but also just kind of like her flexing some other musical muscles. Because um, she's a, a certain, like, her sound is very, like, a vibe. You get a vibe. You feel like a warm, fuzzy, a warm, fuzzy red sweater wrapped around you when you're listening to her. But, you know, creating a vibe like that with music um, is really challenging, especially when you're in jazz and you want to take it a step further and go really far out or avant-garde, anything like that. Yeah. Totally. And that seemed, that's the more the traditional thing that I personally shied away from. I was like, oh, no, I, I want to keep it just simple. I don't want to get too tangential or complex. I want to make it listenable to, and appealing to a yeah. mass of people, which is coming from the jazz tradition. No, people are like, no, we just we want to feel good and do our thing. We don't care. And I'm like, well, you got to think about your audience kind of too. <laughs> and, you know, because, of course, the jazz, like the elite jazz audience is going to be pretty small but pretty loyal right you're going to get the same people come in but they're it's small when you take a chance moving forward those like elite jazz loyal people might not be there for you but you're going to pull some other people into your mix and I think that is a it's a hard you know chance to take um because I'm also about to take it because it's not like changes made me a superstar or anything like that but it was a great way to feel out all right, what kind of music works for me? And then having to perform it. Does it feel good to have to perform it all the time? And like, what do I need more in my live set? And like recording an album is different from doing a show. And like, again, figuring out how you do both and who you are in each sort of setting is really, it's a tricky situation. Yeah. So. Were they, did you get the sense wanted you to kind of at Concord stick to a more traditional jazz path with changes or did you have a lot of liberty? To um, I was definitely able to make it more of a crossover. They were totally down with some like, you know, R and B covers and stuff like that. Cause they know those are my influences. Um, what really brought it together was Lawrence's arranging. You can't put all those songs on an album and be like, go it's like, yeah, but what is going to tie them together? It has to be this kind of progressive, sophisticated, yet listenable music. And it definitely is sophisticated, but it's listenable. And it's, I don't know, the, the general vibe of that album for me is very, like, uplifting and positive. Um, and a lot of my tunes are, you know, about my own struggles that I hope bring a little more light to other people. Um, this one, of course, was a love song, which is rare, but they happen. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think it, it's good to have some sort of force guiding you, some sort of label, some sort of mentorship or team of people who love you and can support you, um, but to make sure that you always, like, go with your gut and heart first. Yeah, definitely. 100% agree. <laughs> and I'm really excited to hear yeah. your new album. When do you think the ETA is? Well, now with, with oh, like, I imagine it's been pushed a little, like mine has. Everything, yes. I mean, in my hopes and dreams, it was always 2020, but now it feels like it could be later 2020, or it could be, um, you know, it's all about recording. When are we going to be able to record? And then do I have a good six months to market and figure out that end of the spectrum? Um, it's different from jazz. If you're just going to release a tune, you don't have to, like, plan a tour around the tune. You know, that's <laughs> like with jazz, it's like you release an album, you got to have a tour. But I have a lot of things that were, you know, coming up this summer that are great, not happening, um, which is fine, totally fine. I understand, um, and eventually things will get back together. And again, the revolutionary thing, like I think, I think post quarantine, people are going to be itching once it's available and safe to do so, to be surrounded by the art. Like I, I, I mean, I'm sure everyone who's taking their daily, you know you know, sanity walk is kind of realizing, oh my God, like the budding of a single leaf on a tree is just beautiful. It's just the most remarkable thing. And I never thought about it before. <laughs> no, I'm having all these epiphanies on my quiet walks in the evening. I'm just like, oh, like all these uh -huh. opening. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, I think returning to like just true admiration for beauty needs to come back 
you know? And I think people are going to be itching for it, like the real stuff, not just like a big pop show that costs millions of dollars to put on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you think this will stick around or do you think the live streaming will just tank after things reopen? You know, it, it feels like a really good backup and a really good option for people who might, um, might not have gig opportunities or might want to get started in an easier place. Um, I don't think we'll have enough listeners all the time to be, you know, connected to our phones. It's like, I have this love hate relationship with social media like right now in quarantine, I'm like, yeah, it's working. I get it. It means something for me. And then out in the, you know, normal life, I'm like, Ooh, no, this is yeah. not. This is a vortex and a trap. <laughs> yes, it's the enemy. It's not good. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it... We have to fight it because this is our platform. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been a struggle. I'm not the most tech savvy millennial you'll meet. So don't tell anyone. No, neither am I. But I, I, you know, I really respect people like, like, I think Bria Skonberg is an amazing artist that like has very regular live streams where she does them herself. I'm like, okay, go Bria. Like crazy. I mean, we're watching a couple of Cirilla Mays. Um, there are a lot of Zoom concerts going on that I haven't attended. Um, Cirilla May, I mean, Emmett's doing a bunch, Emmett Cohen, Benny Benack. Um, and who else was I just seeing the other day? I don't know. Well, at least my content has a lot more video footage than I'm used to, whether it's like, you know, virtual recordings from here, which are really challenging. I mean, that's not natural to make music like that. And making it feel natural and look natural is hard. And I think there needs to be an understanding, you know, from the audience that like, ooh, that's so natural. <laughs> so, yeah. That's a little slack, you know, for the delay and everything. <laughs> right, right, of course. Well, this has been a lot of fun. It's it's been uh, I think this is our first time actually talking face to face. You know, I know we. I know. Nice to to talk with you to hear you play and your beautiful music, and I think we sh we share a similar kind of compositional style. I I hear a lot of similarities. So. Oh yay! But uh, yeah, let's let's stay in touch, and I you know hopefully your album comes out when you want it to, and it sounds great, and I'm excited for you. And, um, yeah, thank you for being a part of Hannah's Corner. Oh, my God. Thank you for inviting me into your cozy little corner. <laughs> Literally. <a> pleasure. <laughs> it's a great-looking corner. Best one I've seen. This, too, is a corner of sorts. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> awesome. Well, I hope you have a great rest of your night. Take, be well. Be safe. Take care. Yes, you, too. Thanks so much, Hannah. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, my friends. Bye.